And good morning if you're just joining us. Let's see a number of squares loading in. So as I say, good morning and welcome this morning. Just give a couple more seconds for everybody to load in. There are quite a number of people on the call, so uh, I'm sure the bandwidth is ever so slightly getting used to it. Super. So we are one minute past the hour, so more than happy to try and kick things off. So good morning and welcome again. Um, I can see everyone has joined in and um, just by way of introduction for those of you that don't know me, um, my name's Chris and I'm the Regional Membership Manager for the Midlands and East of England here at Make UK. Um, and we're here this morning, of course, to talk about COVID-19 safety, what we can do to try and keep our sites a bit safer um, also look at, have a reflection on testing, a reflection on visits from, from the HSE, which we're seeing more and more so across our membership, but also um, a re reflection on the BSI guidance which was released just before Christmas regarding um, workplace safety as well, which my, my colleague will go through in just a moment. So in terms of the outline this morning, we will firstly be hearing from one of my colleagues in our health and safety team, who, as I say, will go through some of those you know, guidance measures and and security. We'll then move forward hearing from members um, across those issues. But um, of course, please do use the chat to share um, and add anything in there. We, of course, going to have different opinions and different experiences of the things over the last year. So please do share. And what we want to do is, is get some best practice and shed light on that. So the chat function is at the bottom, as I'm sure you're more familiar with from Zoom and, and Teams over the last number of months. Um, and we'll kind of go from there. But um, Please do keep yourself on mute as we move forward um, and raise your hand or pop things in the, in the chat. If you do have any specific questions, one of our guest speakers this morning will be able to um, get back to you. So starting things off then, um, I'd just like to look, introduce Ian Hunter, who's, my, as I say, my colleague from Make UK's Health and Safety Consultancy team. Um, he'll be able to talk a little bit more um, around our work with members and what we've been seeing over the last unfortunately close to a year during the, the pandemic so over to you Ian in the first instance. Thank you Chris and good morning everybody and uh, let me just say first of all it's really good to have this opportunity to uh, speak to, to everyone it doesn't happen very often so it's great to be here and uh, as Chris said my name is Ian Hunter I'm the head of uh, health and safety and environmental consultancy at Make UK and uh, I'm kicking off this morning uh, to set the scene really, thinking about uh, 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 primarily, I guess, when we speak about COVID secure, what are we really talking about and how do we keep, how do we keep tabs on that as um, the pandemic and all its various forms uh, develop over time. So I, I've kind of worked out three things that I'd like to, to speak about and I'm going to kick off by talking about um, what is COVID secure and what does the guidance say about that. Um, I will then uh, speak about the new uh, ISO um, publicly available specification, PAS 45005. You may have seen that released in, in, in uh, December. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then I thought it would be useful um, from some of our own uh, Make UK audit work just to, to wrap up with, uh, for my session, some of the key findings, some of our experiences that... Um, We've, we've encountered in our, in our site visits around the country. So um, let, me, let me kick off then with speaking a little bit about what do we think COVID secure means. And I guess the first thing to say is that as, as Chris mentioned, we've been, we've been doing this for over a year now or nearly a year. And uh, we should be, I think all of us are, very familiar with some of the, the basic um, control measures that we, we ought to have in place in our, in our business. And uh, we're familiar with the guidance, I'm sure, that the HSE have been issuing and also the early guidance from the government updated through, through the, the last year as the pandemic has progressed. I've split those 
things into two areas, really, uh, physical controls and organisational controls. So let me just talk about the physical first of all. Uh, again, I think we all know this. It's, it's, it's not particularly new. We've got some nuances, perhaps, to think about. But uh, we've got uh, things like social distancing to consider in the two metre and one metre rules. Uh, we've got uh, uh, hygiene and cleaning in the workplace, uh, managing our cleaning processes, probably increasing and upgrading those activities. Um, we've got aspects such as face covering uh, or, or not, uh, a point of debate. And I can think way back to nearly this time last year, March, April, there was lots of debate about uh, the value of face covering, but I think we've come to recognize that over the 12 months, face coverings are playing quite an important part in, in this. And we'll perhaps come back to that a little bit later on. So these three things that are the, the hands, face, space, mantra that we've heard from everybody um, and well understood I think everywhere else but if you read some of the other physical aspects of control particularly HSE guidance we can see aspects such as ventilation creeping into the equation which um, is always a tricky one not well understood in my experience uh, and is but it's becoming increasingly important uh, the value of, of good ventilation fresh air in, in the workplace so those are the kind of physical things we're thinking about. I'll talk a bit more about this in, in, in a little bit more detail in a moment, but um, just move on to the organisational controls. Probably the main aspect here has been homeworking, and um, we've all been challenged, every business has been challenged to think about how we work out who can work from home and who should be working at home, and, and also how to actually put that in practice, the resources, equipment, and all the other things you need to to maintain uh, a, a large proportion of your employee group actually working from home and no longer on, uh, on, on the work site. Um, lots of challenges around that. Uh, and I guess in some ways we are, uh, I, I just venture to say, we're probably actually surprised at how well that has worked. Uh, and uh, I think you know, we all know many organizations actively considering not returning many of those workers back to work, they will stay at home. So um, very important aspect of control, I think, because home working is probably, being at home is probably the safest place to be right now. We've also got all the other uh, uh, aspects around communication and consultation to think about. Uh, lots of uh, considerations there about how to communicate, how to consult and how that can work properly. But um, again, you will remember back to the early part of 2020, great emphasis placed upon involvement of people in the workplace, and that remains extremely important uh, today. And uh, the final point here uh, is, is the aspect of vulnerable people in the workplace, um, those, the segment of our employee group that are more vulnerable for whatever reason to, to the virus and how we, how we actually protect those people specifically. So I've skipped through there uh, um, a, a, an overview, if you like, of some of the basic requirements of COVID security. Uh, I've made it all sound very, very simple. I haven't mentioned risk assessment yet, but of course, all those aspects should be covered in your risk assessment. But uh, believe, believe me, I, we can't get into the detail here. I haven't really got time. Um, but believe me, I'm not underestimating the, co the complexity of any of that. And uh, in my experience, look at social distancing as an example, uh, it sounds simple and straightforward in principle, but actually in practice, it, it's often very difficult to achieve. And um, I've seen great uh, um, effort and, and time spent on achieving good control of some of these aspects. So um, well understood, I think, you know, we're all used to adopting these measures when we're, when we're out in public ourselves, shopping or wherever. But actually in the workplace, this is a much more complex um, situation and does require a very strong and uh, detailed risk assessment process to, uh, to make that work properly. The second point to probably add here is, the, is this the whole picture? And I'd probably just like to venture the idea that this is actually far from the whole picture. And actually to make all of that work uh, in the workplace, we do have to have uh, a, a lot of strong leadership. We need um, competence within the team, competence to help us understand the issues properly. We need a management structure uh, that is fully engaged and is taking action on the ground floor in terms of implementing these uh, measures. And then 
coming back to the point about leadership, we need lots of review and monitoring to make sure that what we've been trying to do in terms of the physical and organizational controls is actually working properly. And of course, this is where uh, our, our PAS 45005 actually comes in. It, it gives us the framework against which we can work. Um, so if I move on to that point, if you haven't heard of it yet, uh, in December, uh, the International Standards Organization released a publicly available specification for, or, or titled, uh, Guidelines for Safe Working in, in, in the Pandemic. Uh, uh, and uh, you, you'll probably get from the number 45005, it comes from the same stable produced by the same technical committee that um, ISO 45001 was uh, uh, um, drawn up by. Uh, released in 2018 and we probably most of us heard of 45001 uh, uh, by now so that specification uh, released in december provides us with the plan do check act framework that we're all familiar with in terms of management systems these days that helps us to manage our our covid security at work and it's designed to help us take good and effective action to help us uh, demonstrate that we've got control of the, the risks at work and also that um, you are adapting and changing to the ever-changing face of the pandemic. So uh, it, it does have a, a very strong uh, focus on managing this as an ongoing activity. And as I've mentioned already, it, it, it is broadly similar in its, in its, um, in its format to, to 45001. So aspects of it, uh, I don't think will be a surprise to many of us. If we look at them, we do have context of the organisation, we have leadership and participation of uh, the workforce forming a strong part of it in the very early parts of the, of the standard. It does, however, have uh, a number of clauses that are specifically focused on, uh, on coronavirus and on issues around the pandemic. So it does have uh, clauses uh, that speak about uh, uh, dealing with confirmed cases. It speaks about psychological health and, and well-being of workers. Uh, it speaks about inclusivity. Um, it speaks about, in some detail, about, uh, about hygiene and, and cleaning. And these, of course, are things that you won't find in 45,001, but, uh, but are present in, in, in this standard. And um, uh, uh, one of the, the latest standards in, in the document is, is in clause 13, is about monitoring, uh, which is the process of keeping tabs on what's going on making sure that the, the measures that you decided you need to implement are actually being maintained as time moves on. And we have been able here at Make UK to develop a COVID compliance audit that is now aligned with um, the, the PAS 45,005. So we can come in to your business and carry out an audit for you that will help you understand how and whether or not you do comply with, first of all, the guidelines, but also with the um, with the, uh, the, this um, publicly available specification 45005. So uh, uh, this is a particularly important activity. I think uh, it, it is over a year uh, since we first had to deal with these issues and uh, we're still in a lockdown, sadly. Um, no better time actually to um, check and validate that what you put in place 12 months ago is, um, is still effective today. So uh, it provides that um, reassurance if you want that your controls and measures are working. Uh, I wanted to, in the sort of final part of, of my session here, is just to talk about some of the things that we have discovered in carrying out these audits and the things that we found through last year in, in working in organisations and managing their, their control measures. So I picked out four things that I think are particularly important and things that you might focus in on in your own business. Uh, I'm sure some of these you, you, you've spent hours and hours working on already, but um, these are things that tend to be uh, overlooked in favour of those physical things that are, that are much more visible. And uh, the first one I picked out here it is about leadership. And it, it, it's really um, my recommendation that you, that you focus in on leadership and encourage your senior business leaders to remain in, involved in, in managing your your COVID risks, uh, taking a lead in terms of communication, leadership communication, uh, particularly setting the policies and encouraging the rest of your management group and, and your employee, your employees as a whole to, 
remain focused on compliance with those controls. Um, in 45,005, there's a requirement for, for management review, as you would imagine. And again, this requires leadership input to um, take a grip of that review and, and check thoroughly that things are working properly. Uh, try to encourage your leaders to be visible around this and um, try to encourage your line managers to take ownership of, co of, of COVID control. This is, you know, as a safety issue, is an issue that extends far beyond uh, the, the health and safety department. It affects everybody in and out of work. And that requires a great dedication from everybody actually to, 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 to uh, comply with the requirements and does require ownership by, by line managers. So please focus in on that. Uh, uh, in my experience, um, it, it is, it, it, you know, operational priorities can take the fall and, and uh, you know we have to manage this COVID risk alongside um, producing our products and, and getting those products out the door to our customers very important that leadership remains engaged around that uh, the second area that i picked on was um, is this area of communication and consultation very strongly stressed by um, government and by by the hsc throughout the whole of this process but it is 12 months um, uh, uh, passing by, nearly since the, since the pandemic began. Uh, we're getting a bit tired. Our motivation is waning. Um, are we becoming complacent? Now more than ever, we need to step up our communication. So communication from leaders in the business, um, using every channel of communication that we can, from toolbox talk right up to executive briefing, um, making that communication as far as we can two-way so using all of the, the mechanisms we have in the business to consult with representatives and safety champions and other people who can help convey the message, but also making sure that our supervisors, I mentioned it a few moments ago, our supervisors also support that by daily conversations around, uh, around um, um, staying compliant with COVID measures. And um, again, I think this is an area where uh, we can improve uh, I, I would suggest daily communication if it's possible around, around um, complying with COVID control and um, making that uh, a way of engaging the workforce, I think it is, is really, really important. And again, in the 45,005 standard, clause 9.3 clause 9 is about ongoing communication and engagement. So uh, have a think about that. How does your communication strategy work? What are, what are your communication plans? day to day, week on week about um, complying with the, with the requirements. Uh, the third area I, I picked out, very important one is about risk and risk, uh, risk control. Uh, and of course, this varies from site to site and business to business, scale of business has a big impact potentially. But uh, the key point here, I think, is that risk is not evenly distributed. Uh, uh, risk is unevenly distributed. And for much of the time, risk is, um, you know, is moderate in many areas in our offices, in, in our uh, um, low occupancy locations, but across the business that we have hotspots of risk. And, uh, you know, think about your own business where people gather or where there, there's a, a high footfall. Those are areas that, that require particular vigilance in terms of understanding how they should be controlled. And I, I think uh, and would recommend that those areas also require a, a specific level of risk assessment. And I would probably suggest to you here that uh, if you have one risk assessment, but particularly for a large operation, one risk assessment that covers the whole operation, that's unless it's done in great detail in certain areas, and I have seen examples of that, uh, that single risk assessment is unlikely to be enough. Uh, it's important to get down to these hotspots, the actual areas where people are doing things, coffee machines, canteens, smoke shelters, what, what happens in the car park, what happens when people are clocking in in the morning. These are, these are high risk areas where uh, special attention is, is needed. Uh, so important point there uh, uh, to have a think about. And the final one uh, I'd like to mention is, is about behavior. Um, I have seen the best and uh, the most superb uh, physical controls undone by unsafe behaviour. And uh, as we all know, uh, especially these days in the world of health and safety, it's not uh, the physical things that keep people safe, it's managing how people behave that keeps people safe. Uh, and again, this has a leadership uh, um, aspect to it because 
uh, we need to require our leaders, our managers and supervisors to continually monitor and challenge behaviour at work. Uh, and, you know, employ all the mechanisms that you can to achieve that. Uh, um, walkabouts by managers, uh, uh, daily inspections, add in your communication, play on the moral duty that everybody has to uh, uh, comply with the um, with the uh, uh, requirements, you know, implement COVID marshals, use your, um, use your safety reps to support that process, continually observe what people are getting up to in their day-to-day -day work and don't allow, uh, the, the, don't allow the backsliding, it's constant rigor. So um, you really keep focus on that. And as I say, I've seen some really good uh, uh, physical control work undermined by people in, the, in a business uh, not behaving. Uh, in, in a safe way. So that's a good overview of uh, what uh, COVID secure means. Uh, I tried to pick out a few points there that you can perhaps think about in your own business. If you'd like us to come along and carry out an audit, we're ready to do that. We have the aligned uh, audit program 45,005 to, to, to do that for you. It all happens in a day in, in most cases. Uh, uh, so uh, it's, it's highly informative. So just get in touch if you need that. And I think Chris, I'm handing over to uh, Tim Tim Kibble from uh, ZF Lemford, I believe, Chris. Yes, so uh, thanks, Ian, and uh, yeah, thanks for your expertise and, and overview there of what's been a really busy period for, for, I know you personally helping supporting members in different businesses as well, obviously focused on manufacturers. And with that in mind, um, we're really pleased to have um, Tim Kibble with us this morning, who is um, the plant director at ZF Lemford. Um, if you've not heard of them, they are an interna international suspension and steering technology provider um, within the automotive sector and based not too far from me in the West Midlands. And their team has been working cross-functionally um, across operations, HR, health and safety and that kind of thing to ensure um, safety on their sites. And they're going to kind of, and Tim, you're more than welcome to, to share your screen. Um, and they're going to share their journey um, across the last few months within the pandemic as we move into to lockdown three. Just before you, you crack on, Tim, apologies to anyone that's just joined us late. I think there's been a couple of technical problems via Zoom. So apologies again, we are recording and we're more than welcome to um, share what some of, the, some of the bits we may have missed from Ian just now. But um, you're joining us just in time to hear from Tim as he will talk us through his presentation. Right, um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'll take you through our journey with COVID-19, but a little bit about um, ZF first. Not many people have heard of us. So, um, founded back in 1915, uh, making gearboxes for um, Zeppelin aircrafts. And we're a first-tier automotive supplier. And it, it's quite, I'm quite um, lucky that I've got the corporate resources to tap into for some of this COVID-19. Um, safety. So 150,000 people. You've probably heard of ZF gearboxes, um, but we're the chassis and suspension components side of that. We've got a plant in Darleston. We're about 90 million sales. So I've got 250 people to look after. Plus we've got about 150 people at our Solihull facility. That's uh, just in sequence manufacturing for JLR. Pr predominantly we make control arms. Majority of that's in aluminium nowadays. We shut the plant down in the 23rd of March, like most folks, when the government announced the closure. We opened up again on the 5th of May. Um, and in that time, we unfurloughed the union representatives. We got GMB for blue collar. We got um, white collar with Unite. They worked with us on our uh, risk assessment and measures and we started putting those in place um, and then defaulted to work from home for everybody else who isn't in operations. So you got all your production operators in and uh, maintenance and that type, but most of logistics sales um, um, accounts and that can work from home. Our initial measures, one of the big problems we had was car sharing. You can't stop it. Um, so, um, we've got strict rules, but it's difficult to police. We keep uh, one way in, one way out, and the doors are jarred open and sanitised. The one-way system in the plant to try and keep people apart. 
one of the important points, and it was just measured by uh, mentioned by Ian. We took out the vending machines, we took out the lockers, um, the coffee machines, and everyone comes to work in a PPE with flasks of tea or coffee. We provided some water to stop these touch points. Um, the um, face masks, um, being part of a big corporate company, they even set a one of the plants started making face masks to um, supply the rest of ZF. Another important little uh, innovation we did with the uh, taps, they put like the surgical taps in you use your elbows with instead of um, hand taps. We did a work, we split the shifts up and got it to one person per table at break time. So we had different break times for everybody and it's sanitized in between breaks. Foot, little foot um, operated doors to stop you touching with your fingers. Zero face to face meetings. So it's all now Teams or Zoom or Skype. And then very strict visitor controls. I have to sign off people to visit the plant. Communications was a big thing because we do a monthly plant brief or um, to all plant members. So through all three shifts. That's face to face in a room of up to 80 people at a time. So what we come up with with the unions was we had everybody's personal email address, created one big um, email uh, every month and just kept emailing people. What sales like? Um, what's the customer doing? What are the measures we're putting in place? And kept everybody in the, the picture with what's going on in the plant. Then when they came back to work, we did inductions with very small groups. Um, and they went through a COVID induction of about two hours. And then a plant tour showing them where all the one-way systems were and all the things they had to be careful of before they started work. So we really brought people in slowly in very small groups over, over a few weeks. We put TV screens up in the factory with some of the measures and information, business information. Um, to keep the communications high. And we work very closely with the GMB and Unite. They're almost an extension of the management team and lots of um, conversations going on daily with the operations guys and the Unite reps and the GMB, canvassing ideas, opinions, and building those into the risk assessments. And then we've got uh, COVID plant controls all in one easy access for everybody in teams. Compliance auditing. Within a few minutes of seeing the Make UK email from, uh, um, I, I immediately got in touch with uh, Tony and says, we need an audit. You're, you're offering these audits. So um, but can you please come in? And he spent time with us in Darlison and Solihull. We got 95% compliance with some miners that were paperwork in logistics was a potential problem with drivers handing paper between people. Um, that's not easy to fix, particularly with Brexit and all these signatures required. Um, and then how do we um, make sure people are safe at home in terms of risk assessments because of their office chairs, equipment, tables and, and that. So that was a good experience. Um, I'd uh, invite anyone to do the same. Further control measures. Where are we now? Because what I've already mentioned, you've probably already done. What we're looking at now, we've installed nano-safe anti-COVID pads for door handles. For the few doors we can't leave open um, uh, and, and push buttons, got nanotechnology. We've also, in the last two months, bought a fogging machine, which we use for routine and, and emergency sanitising. So have a team come around the weekend, fog the offices and certain machines. And if we've had a, 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 an area where people have had to be sent home because of symptoms or fog that area. And then the maintenance team put some clever sensors in the doorways on the toilets. So only one person can be in the toilets as a red light. When they come back out, the green light comes on. So trying to keep as least amount of people in the toilets at any one time. Big thing is case management. We've had a very, we've been very um, careful Anyone got the minor sniffle or temperature, they go home without delay. 
we, we don't uh, mess around. And then we ask all the questions over the phone afterwards and have a case management review using the government close contact guidelines immediately with HR and the supervision. We've also brought in private testing um, because we were initial, initially we were finding that the lead time for testing from the government was taking too long. So we've, uh, we do that um, locally with a local company. We get really fast results within a day. And then we can also do anyone who's been in contact with that person. We use an agency company to backfill our absence because we are running at about 15% absence at the moment because of self-isolation. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, I have a question actually with regarding the private testing. So you're saying that you get these test results um, rapidly. Um, can I ask if that's through the lateral flow testing that you're doing that? No, PCR. Oh, oh it is. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Um, and then we have a COVID team meeting at 7.30 on a Monday morning with the other plants in the UK. And we discuss how many case management, how many new cases we got, what we got to do what we've learned, uh, and then, then we kick off with the, the rest of the week. What have you learned? Next steps. Changing behaviours to the new normal has been and continues to be a real challenge. Um, we've started to get consequential. We've, last week we did our first formal disciplinary meeting and warning with a repeat offender. So the supervisors keep a record of any misdemeanours, if you call it that. And we've had to do that first consequential uh, meeting. The NHS contact tracing app can be very disruptive. We had a case in a plant um, up north that, where someone had left the phone on in their locker and it pinged a lot of other people who walked past the locker. So we, we've told people to turn the tracing up, app off at work for that very case. And the tech, now, now what we're debating in the plants, talking about it last week and, and this week, we're looking at setting up routine testing in the plant using the lateral flow test. Um, we're still talking about it, so I'd, I'd be interested in listening if other people have put that in place. I have. Um, can, you hear, oh, oh. can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. I, I put lateral flow testing in two weeks ago. And I've had um, three positives. One of them was asymptomatic and is still asymptomatic today. So would have carried on coming to work and we've not done the lateral flow test. There yeah. is um, quite a high rate. It's about 50% 50 false, false positives on those lateral flow um, tests it's as not. well. It's not. I don't know where you're reading that from. I've gone through Lancaster University and a professor of virologist called Dr. Menea. These are not 50%, they're the old ones. The new tests that you can buy now are 97% sensitive to pick yeah, up. I, yeah, ours, ours is 99% sensitive and all our asymptomatic people have um, either developed symptoms, they've gone on to have the NHS test and it's been all positive. The direction that we received was that if you have a positive lateral flow test, the very first thing you have to do is get yeah. an NHS test. You can yeah. get it test and trace. Yeah. So it kind yeah. of, whether it's a false or negative, false positive or not, doesn't matter. You still should yeah. get the same and, you know, yeah. you'll get a full test. I think there's room for questions and, and, and debate at the end, is the Chris, as well? Yeah, apologies to interrupt and um, please do share your comments and experiences because I know there's a, there's a bit of a debate around testing and we will come to to um, John, one of our guest speakers I'll introduce a little bit later on, who will, will talk about the various solutions and where we're up to with that. Um, please do pop any chat questions and chats and experiences of that in, in the chat at this stage. And um, I, just, I know you're coming towards the end of your, your area, Tim, and we'll certainly be revisiting that. And the final thing, I mentioned we're part of a big group with lots of resources, and, and ZF have done a lot of work now on CO2 measurement. Um, and I'm looking at... in. Uh, installing some co2 meters we bought the first bit of equipment to start measuring it um i know um uh, that's been mentioned so i think the big ones for me are going forward to routine testing and maybe some co2 measurement okay that's me done chris brilliant thank you tim and as you say i know speaking to you and some of your team over the last few weeks it's been a real journey and, and looking to engineer solutions um, as things move on 
I just wanted to, to take a moment to reiterate, apologies if you have had any technical problems joining us this morning. We have recorded um, since the very beginning and I think the majority have been able to hear Tim and go through some of, some of his journey with us. I just wanted to ever so slightly revisit some of the things that we heard from, from Ian, who's one of my colleagues at, at Make UK, one of our health and safety experts. And I think Tim went, mentioned there some of the key things and there was a lot of overlap about what, what you said earlier, Ian, about leadership and, and working across several areas. I wondered if you wanted to just quickly revisit some of your top tips um, Ian, for those that have joined us a little bit later, and also maybe say a little bit about the audit that we've 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 worked with Tim on, but um, but our colleague Anthony went in to help with Tim on. Well, the first thing I'd say is from uh, you know just picking up on what Tim said, you can see from Tim's uh, uh, statements the, the degree of detail that is necessary to go to. So I, I probably pick up on my third. Uh, uh, finding that I, I finished up on, which is about the risk assessment one. Uh, the, the risk assessment, you know, one one large document, even if it's quite detailed, uh, covering a, a, a large site will not be enough to get down to the real detail that, that you will experience operationally. And I think it's, it, it's fundamentally important to look for these hotspot areas where, um, and even, even if these are areas where people are informally um, you know, coming across each other, uh, they need really close looking at, and uh, they are they are areas to do with how people move around in the business. So, for example, you know, getting to and from canteens, getting to coffee and from coffee machines, going to meetings, whatever they're doing, um, but also in those operational areas where you can't maintain the the, um, the two meter distancing, or, or you have people you know working closely together from time to time and, and they do require really detailed analysis and um, proper observation and real real detailed consideration about how to manage those uh, those particular risks and um, okay the, the audit that we carry out uh, um, uh, will identify those areas but it does require this this kind of risk-based thinking to really understand what's going on in, in, in those in those situations and you know, come up with innovative, innovative ways to, to fix them, really. Brilliant. Thanks, Ian. And, and Tim, we've had a couple of questions, which are, we'll, as I say, well, we will be revisiting testing, but just from a, how you've done things on an operational level, Tim, I think we've got a, a question that says, is this something for your employee? Have you taken permission from your employees or, or have you made testing mandatory? That's a good question. Well, um, when you say... Uh, yeah. Well, that everyone's complied and done it. No one's refused. So, um, it, it, if we have someone who's ill or, or exhibits symptoms, we'll send them out the, the building, out the plant, to go and get a, a test with the um, NHS. Um, if the NHS can't get it quick enough, which they, they do nowadays, but they didn't, we'll use a private company. Um, and then we'll test the immediate people based on risk, those that have been in contact with them, with, a, with, with someone private, unless the NHS could do it quickly. But uh, we haven't made it mandatory, but we've never had a problem with, with, with individuals. Another thing that's coming around testing, you mentioned the private company, and you're more than welcome to say where you've got your PCR tests from because they are an affiliate, uh, an advantages partner. So what's your experience um, been with, like, as I say, the, the partner of ours, Westfield Health, uh, for PCR testing, has that been a smooth process working with them? Yeah, they've been they've been first class. Um, very very quick service, very professional. Um, within twenty four hours, we're done. So, um, yeah, Westfield Health, excellent. Brilliant. I think um, probably one last thing as we look to move on is that we've got a question around your CO two CO two measurement, which I must say was was new when we spoke about it in, in recent weeks. Um, so what's the reason for that and what, what you're hoping to achieve with that? And try and explain that a little bit for those who have joined us. Yeah, well, well I attended my first presentation on it last week. If you can measure CO2 in a room, you can check the fresh air. So um, what we're looking at with the meters is we'll be able to assess in each room how much fresh air is in there with the windows open or the ventilating, ventilation system on. Uh, and how many people are in the room. So you've got to work out the volume of air and there'll be some limits on the CO2 levels. 
and then we can fit the, the, the ultimate goal is you fit a small CO2 alarm in there, but if it falls below X, it bleeps, then people know they've got to open the windows wider or get out of there. It could be that the virus could be um, more dangerous. Super, thanks Tim. And just to, I think as a, as a point for pause, we're going to launch a poll now and it will ask around the testing. So please do take a moment to read some of these questions and fill in. Um, answers are anonymous. It won't be shared with, with what the answers are. It's just a good guidance for, for our two remaining speakers and also make UK with our activity and what's, what's really going on. So I'll shut up for just a few seconds and there's a, a few questions on your screen which will be kind enough to answer them for us. So I'll give it another 10 or so seconds. We've had lots of answers, so thank you very much. And I'll go through the results in just a moment. Super, I'll close the poll there. And just share those results with everybody. So really interesting to see what's come in in regards to are you confident in your COVID-19 safety measures? I think we've certainly heard from members recently around, and I think Ian mentioned it earlier, around being much safer in the workplace than at home, although 65% are somewhat confident in their, um, in their site safety, but it's really pleasing to see that nobody's particularly unconfident whatsoever, which is brilliant. Um, in regards to absence management and those that are either shielding or self-isolating, um, it seems that one to 10% is the, the vast majority of, of answer with regards to levels of the staff that are off. Um, in terms of visits from the Health and Safety, Safety Executive, which will lead us on to our, our next speaker in just a moment, about two thirds have not been visited or um, inspected on these measures. And testing, around half haven't explored testing whatsoever. So interesting to see a couple of, uh, of added, avid questions and debates in the chat, as I've just seen come through. And the majority have explored, but not implemented. So I'd be interested to hear from you, John, a little bit later on that. And quite a number of people on the call would like to know a little bit more around our COVID-19 compliance audits, as, a little bit as described by Tim. So thank you very much for that. So. Keen to move on to our, our, our next agenda item, really, which is we're pleased to be joined by Barry Cunliffe, who's the Group Finance Director at, at Tinsley Bridge, who, for those of you who may not know them, are a forging and heat treatment specialist um, located in Sheffield for a number of different sectors. And they've had a visit from the Health and Safety Executive. So unlike nearly the two thirds on the call that haven't, so they can share a little bit on what that was like um, and what to potentially expect. So if I can hand over to you, please, Barry. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, I think um, our uh, what the, the procedures that we've and the protocols we've implicated uh, implemented here are similar to ZF. It's a few minor differences, but very similar. So we have two buildings on this site. We have a new factory and offices uh, that's about uh, four or five years old, uh, and then we have a big old 1950s British steel shed that's very, very drafty uh, and very open. Um, the new building obviously complies with um, current building regs and is designed not to be very drafty. So we tend to leave some roller shutter doors there to uh, improve the airflow uh, through the building. And on the front of the new factory are the offices, which are on three floors. Um, but all we have all of the one-way systems, et cetera, 
uh, within the, the the site as a whole and within individual buildings. Um, about 12 weeks ago, something like that, we had a cluster of positive tests in the new factory, which is Tizak machine knives, um, which was a little bit annoying for us because most workers work on individual CNC machines. And if they were uh, following the protocols, then in theory, the risk of having a cluster should have been very low, but we had a cluster of four. Um, we think we've identified the person that brought it in. Uh, and the assumption is that the other three caught it off that person who probably uh, brought it into the, the workplace. So having that small cluster, we reported it to Public Health England. And we had a point of contact within Public Health England who was based in Humberside. Um, we had a few calls with, um, with that contact who took all our details. Uh, we explained to him the procedures and protocols we had in place. Um, and he was quite happy that it was um, a controlled and contained cluster. It hadn't spread to any other areas of the factory and it hadn't spread across uh, shifts. So we're quite happy that the protocols we have in place for cleaning down touch screens, etc., were working in that sense. And it was only the people that were working on the sh same shift. Uh, again, no lockers, um, everyone working in their own location uh, with some other rules relaxed, like drinking on the shop floor so each person can have their own drink and whatever. So they should be able to self-isolate on the factory floor. Um, so PHE themselves were quite happy with what we had in place. Um, and our contact then wrote his report and he submitted that to what they call the single point of contact for our area, which was Sheffield. And the single point of contact uh, is an amalgamation of Public Health England, Sheffield City Council and HSE. Um, and, and we thought that was the, uh, the extent of, of uh, the, the process. A few weeks later, unannounced, uh, somebody turned up um, at the front door, effectively, uh, introduced themselves as health and safety executive, flashed a card, uh, they were wearing um, a body cam uh, and they did uh, a walk around of the new factory where the, uh, the cluster had uh, occurred. Um, and we have ev everything is in reception, all the right signage. We're taking people's temperature as they come into site, et cetera, et cetera. So from that point of view, he was quite happy. I wasn't um, on site that day, unfortunately. Um, so it was reported to me that we'd had a visit from HSE. Um, I then went back to my contact at PHE to discuss it and he knew nothing of it whatsoever. Um, he wasn't aware of uh, any visits being done. Um, partic he was particularly annoyed because he was our point of contact with PHE and he hadn't been informed of any visits taking place. Um, we then tried, I then tried to uh, identify the individual that had visited the company and we couldn't do it. Um, eventually, um, I can't remember how we did it, but somebody remembered the name Rundles. Um, so we identified the guy as a representative of Rundles who are um, court bailiffs. Um, so I was a little bit shocked at that, A, that it, a court bailiff had come onto the property and he hadn't been identified uh, properly. Um, but the guys on the on the day who brought him in were happy for whatever reason that the guy was visiting on, on behalf of uh, the health and safety executive. Um, our contact in Public Health England uh, finally got through to the, the route of the appointment and Rundles had been appointed by the health and safety executive to carry out um, site visits for them because they being court bailiffs, they were already um, used to visiting lots of sites. They were fully uh, equipped with the body cams, et cetera. And it was clear that the guy literally just wanted to do a walk round that was videoed, that would then be, the video would then be archived with either HSE, Public Health England, or the single point of contact, 
for future reference or if one of those people wanted to look at that video uh, to check compliance. Um, again, our point of contact with Public Health England was not impressed and was incredibly annoyed that one of his cases had been visited by someone that he wasn't aware of, a company that was contracted by PHE, uh, by uh, the HSE that he wasn't aware of. So it seems to be quite disjointed. From the, the point of the visit, we had an excellent report from the visit. We had no um, uh, sort of non-conformances or, 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 or any criticism of the protocols and the procedures that we have in, pray, in place. So the actual visit went quite well um, uh, in terms of compliance, very well in fact. Um, my, my issue was obviously that we didn't properly identify the guy that came in. Uh, Public Health England's issue was that, and particularly our point of contact, was that he wasn't aware, it was his case, he wasn't informed, and Public Health England didn't even know the HSE had contracted Rundles, a firm of bailiffs, to carry out the inspections on their behalf. Um, so lots of things uh, not perfect, lots of things wrong, but from the point of view of the actual inspection, it went very well. Um, and we received uh, quite a good positive report. I don't know what uh, the other people, the, the third of the um, people uh, on the session today, I don't know if they've had the similar uh, experience, but it was um, uh, strange to say the least. Thanks, Barry. And uh, yeah, we're getting a couple of comments through in the chat that shares some experience of the HSC. I think, um, firstly, just to say we have heard from, from making UK side of things, but like Barry, lots of these spot checks or inspections have gone very well. And at the worst, we've heard of, uh, of minor non-conformances, but on the whole, a positive picture. I think what we're, we're keen to do is raise... Can I, can I just say some... Sorry, because I've just seen a comment saying... Uh, how could a court bailiff be qualified to conduct an h and uh, COVID secure visit? So the issue or what transpires is um, the reason that the bailiff is engaged is because they've already got a, a nationwide team with body cams. And it was clear from the visit that he didn't really know what he was looking for or what he was auditing in terms of compliance. And that why, that's why they've done the walk around with a recorded video. So it must be people at the either HSE or Public Health England that are then picking up on these videos, reviewing the video to do a secondary audit, if you like, based on that evidence. So the person that came to see us had no health and safety knowledge or experience and was literally there just to video the visit. No, absolutely, I think, um... Videoing is not something we've heard lots of, but we have heard a diverse range of experience. As I say, no real negative cases. We have heard, as someone has pop popped in the chat, of a, of a questionnaire in the in the sort of foyer area, and all those all those what more of a day inspection. What we're really trying to do is also share a different experience of it to make members aware that the HSE are are on, on the kind of on the move, if I can put it that way. Of course, the sites that are open at the moment are within the public sector manufacturing sites and construction sites, of course, um, for their inspection and so on, it's um, the frequency for, for our sector is quite high at the moment. Um, I don't see any specific questions. I've got a question in the chat around the recording. Um, so did the report come from HSE after reviewing video evidence? Barry? I, think, I think the guy had an initial tick box, uh, but the report on the system uh, we believe was from an HSE review of, of what was submitted by Rundles. But certainly the guy that came to do the visit had um, no uh, H health and safety knowledge or specific knowledge of COVID protocols. Super, thank you. And, and another comment in there, which, I'll, which I have heard from members before, is we had an unannounced telephone check carried out, confirmed it was genuine by getting them to send me an email from the HSE account and then obviously discuss their measures as well. So um, conscious of kind of moving on with time, we're more than welcome to revisit this towards the end, but I know lots of questions and discussion has been, has been raised around testing. So um, our fourth speaker this morning, or before we creep into the afternoon, 
is John Dennett, who is the Chief Executive at Recovery for Life, who are a professional health provider and offer a range of COVID-19 testing solutions um, and have been doing so throughout the pandemic. So if I can hand over to you, John, and hopefully you've been sort of taking notes in the chat to cover quite a bit of what has been mentioned as well. Okay, well, first of all, um, thanks for the invite on, on guys, and um, we're very pleased to be a Mate UK member. Um, just to, I, I'm not going to talk too much about us, but I will share some of our experience working with our clients and the different tests available. Uh, I'll try and cover as many of the questions that have popped up already and other ones come on. And um, one of the key things is, you know, in the time allowed or the time that we have, there'll be a lot of other questions afterwards. So please feel free. Uh, I know Chris is going to get our contact details shared. Please feel free, even if, you, if you've got, pro, you know, programs in place, it really doesn't matter. We're trying to get as much experience from other clients and from other businesses to see how they're working with testing in the workplace. So just a quick overview from us. We started looking at becoming aware of COVID really through some strange links we have with China back in September 2019 before it really started making its mark. And really it was built on the experience from SARS-16 and various other um, sort of viruses, which if we're being really honest, we've missed uh, dodged bullets on uh, for probably about five years before COVID really hit. So um, we're a specialist drug, alcohol, mental health, testing, training, treatment service. We started looking at testing really uh, around, it would have been sort of end of Feb, beginning of March before the lockdown last year. And we've been working with a multi-sector clients, including oil companies, manufacturers, um, service industries, professional industries, etc., cetera, um, with very different uh, operating circumstances and experience. Our team, I said we're specialists, we really are. We, for example, uh, as part of our team, we are a full clinical team. We do sort of more um, uh, specialist occupational health reviews on certain areas. We deal with addiction, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we really, we started looking at testing. We applied, our approach to testing is based on that work because much of what the work we normally do is based on managing chaos and trying to put some structure into chaos, basically. And so from really, we started doing testing with, uh, particularly with our oil company um, back in March before lockdown. And since then, we were very lucky on our team to have, we've got a range of doctors, medical directors, et cetera, but we also have an infectious diseases consultant who advises us. So although we, we're very care cautious and careful not to break Chinese walls, so to speak, um, what we do have is uh, access to the current research, we're able to touch base with um, what's been happening, particularly internationally, because without sort of making any political points at all, we in the UK haven't managed it, the things in the best way. And many of the real um, sort of really good innovations in testing have come from um, and been used in places like South Korea, Taiwan, Germany, etc. So that's basically who we are, what we do. Um, what's interesting is in terms of testing, we, we've taken a very different approach to testing right from the outset. What we set out was we really wanted to separate out what the purpose of testing was. So the first thing, if, if you look at government testing, NHS testing, PHE testing resources, they are purely driven and as they should be on making sure that people can receive treatment and access to resources if they need it. Well, we working with particularly health and safety colleagues in industries realized was actually that's a different, we've got a different agenda really for the workplace. If somebody's ill in a, may, in a way from a workplace perspective, it's easier to deal with because the NHS will look after them. Okay, what we're looking at is about how do you manage transmission in the workplace and how do you stop whole teams being taken down? So a lot of the work of what I'm going to talk about is based on working with essential services who have to keep running uh, and have had to keep running come, high, you know, hell or high water, basically. But the starting point for us was when we started looking at um, you know, what should be the response to reduce transmission. There were two starting points for us. The very first is actually understanding the life cycle of the virus, um, because it's the virus is, is really very strange compared to other viruses. 
um, in that actually it's got a quite a long in, um, incubation period. And it's also very difficult to judge because everybody's so different. And what that means is if you've got the impact on underlying health conditions, for example, really can make a big difference on how long you may become, um, how long it takes you to become symptomatic, for example. It also, the vast majority of people who will have the virus and, and potentially can transmit it uh, will be asymptomatic. And uh, public sector testing has only recently moved into the area of looking at asymptomatic testing and risk of asymptomatic transmission. So our approach really was to look at what are the points on that life cycle of the virus that you can test against to see actually, first of all, is how long will it take for symptoms to occur? Because most people are, at, you know, some of the research and there is conflicting research indicates that people are most virulent around three days before any symptoms occur, which immediately makes an issue uh, for testing. You need to test that will pick up those antigens very quickly. You also, there is a huge variation in how long people a, are, carry the virus, but also um, uh, how, long they, how long it takes to get better. So a lot of the gu guidance given by PHE and by the NHS, et cetera, and I'm not being critical here, is based on um, a, the, uh, some averages which don't always stack up. And I'll give you a case in a, in a minute uh, about this. Um, so basically in our practice, what we've looked at is trying to assess where people fit in that lifestyle and that uh, life cycle and timeline for the virus if they have it, when they could have contracted it and how long they would be safe to before they can return to work. And we created a, a, a screening tool, which I'll mention straight off because it's free. It's our contribution to the sort of COVID fight, which is uh, called Passport to Work. And I'll share the details afterwards with anybody. But that's actually like an attempt to try and plot an individual circumstances on that life cycle of the virus. So you know when to test and when they could be virulent. So put that to one side for a minute, because I want to get straight into the different tests available. Um, not all tests are equal. Um, there is a, a huge amount of uh, data out there on the efficacy of tests and also the, the frequency one should test with, how long it should take, uh, how often it should be tested and what tests to use. So the main tests that we, um, certainly from the outset, were PCR tests came out, still widely used. We tend not to recommend them now for workplace unless you're specifically using them for travel. And, or if they, you've got a specific reason or you're doing a pilot or trying to assess, um, you know, if you're trying to uh, validate some of the tests that you're using. So what we try and do with our clients is, and it's much cheaper approach because they're most expensive, they're the most expensive test, is if somebody does show positive um, through using lateral flow tests, for example, or they have symptoms, we channel them straight to NHS testing wherever possible. The, um, the exception, of course, is with travel, when you're looking to screen people who are healthy, not to identify people who are ill, if that makes sense. So it's to prove that you're fit enough uh, to travel. So the real tests that are coming on, and there's new technologies coming on all the time, there's quite a significant lag in the time between tests are actually approved by MHRA, and we've had some very interesting battles with MHRA over summer in particular around lateral flow tests, which uh, they eventually actually back down on. Um, and there's been a huge push in technologies, but there's a lot of new technologies coming through um, where um, that haven't been approved finally yet, and those trials are coming through. The tests we use, and this isn't a sales job, but we only use tests, uh, only cell tests we use ourselves and that we validated ourselves. And that's using our infectious control um, uh, consultant, but also around the, we only buy from established relationships and laboratories. Now, the reason this is important is that many of the first tests that were approved, particularly on the lateral flow tests, they're not all the same. And the efficacy, despite the claims of most tests now will claim around a 98, 99% uh, effectiveness, both as sensitivity and specificity. 
But actually, most of those studies are based on very small numbers. So for us, any, any sort of test that's been tested on a sample group of less than 800 and hasn't been tested three, four times, we would dismiss straight away. Now, the reason this is important, and again, it's not meant to sound uh, critical, is there was a lot of coverage of the Liverpool um, uh, open access testing that was carried out um, a little while ago um, with tests, both Innova and SureScreen tests that were used. And the professor who headed up the study, he even admitted that actually um, they primarily would have been looking at it around a 66% accuracy rate. When the British Medical Journal did an independent study on this, um, there is, um, uh, they identified the uh, efficacy, the effectiveness at around 58%, which to be honest, isn't far off tossing a coin if you think about it, if you just use that one as that one point as an indicator. So there's different tests, there's different efficacy, how people actually uh, sample is a big issue. So still to this day, around 30% of PCR tests carried out by the, the NHS um, actually uh, are fail uh, because of poor sampling technique. And um, particularly if the, the two main ways of carrying out the tests, if anybody's had them, and this is for lateral flow or for uh, PCR, it's the same sampling technique, is, uh, I, I mean, I was sent one today, um, the cheapest tests uh, I've noticed are coming out are just testing the nose now. Um, whereas actually it's, you get a, tend to get a better result from the throat, yeah? Um, but there's a, a, a lot of misunderstanding. So the point I would always say to people, if you're going to look at lateral flow tests for the antigen tests, then um, try and get a really, you know, do your homework, look at who's using them, see what the results are. The other test which gets widely overlooked, which actually I think are possibly the most effective tests for the workplace, the antibody tests, the lateral anti -flow, uh, anti, um, lateral flow tests. Because what they do is an instant antigen test will tell you if somebody has the virus currently, an antibody test will be tell you if somebody's come in contact with the virus, but potentially could still transmit it. And the key point for timing when somebody come back to the workplace is when to understand when they are not going to be a risk to their colleagues. So the combination we tend to use with our clients tends to be a combination of a health screening tool like Passport to Work, but many other companies have their own, um, sometimes used in combination with temperature checks, but then an instant antigen test, which will give you an immediate result to see if somebody is currently virulent. These are most of and the only real way of identifying asymptomatic carriers. And then before people return to work, to help you measure that time frame is you use an antibody test. Now, one of the things I've, I've seen some of the chats on the, on the questions was around frequency of testing. The, because if you understand the lifeline and life cycle of virus and the timelines, there's actually um, a lot of people are testing far too much. And yes, you could pick it up every, you know, sort of be tested, give a negative and pick it up the next day. The real thing, though, is in terms of how the gestation periods for the virus sort of develop, actually, it's not really going to give you an indication or much sense testing people every day or every other day even. The, the, the process we've developed with our clients, which has worked very well, um, and I'll give you one example in a minute, has really been focusing on ro rotating tests over a weekly period. And that allows, if somebody has picked up the virus, time for it to gestate and pick up the tests. There's, I've, I've also seen in the chat, so that's one point I would make, that actually frequency doesn't have to be so regularly uh, as people are talking about testing every day, for example. A second bit of a myth is you don't need to be a clinician to understand these tests, but you do have to be trained to use them. And one of our concerns, which we have raised previously with MHRA in terms of approvals, is that anybody can be trained to carry out these tests, but there are, you do need to, um, you need to be actually taken through and shown how to do it to get the correct sampling. 
Um, where we've worked with companies who've done this, we've done some studies. I, we, I can't share the names of the companies, for example, in one in particular. But the, with the oil company, for example, we did manage to, we've carried out over 2,000 antibody tests um, and about the same number, if not more, of antigen tests in that rotated fashion. Now, what we found on there in the, in, since March, we found, uh, let's say, I think we are probably up to about 80, 100 asymptomatic carriers we've identified in that workplace. And that's just one. Another client we worked with had um, a death, the COVID death of a colleague, unfortunately. We went in uh, again, we trained the health and safety teams, the first aiders, those sort of roles to carry out the tests and the HR teams were doing it as well. And interestingly, um, we identified a, out of a workforce of about 400 people, we found around on the first day, I think we we're around 35 asymptomatic carriers in that team. And these, these are good companies, they've done the, the physical distancing, they've put all the physical controls in, good organisational controls. And in real terms, uh, I think we've got to be really careful about and this is where we sort of we have concerns around some of the approaches some PHE teams are taking because every team is responding in a very different way from our experience where you are in the country is that people are responding um, it, in many ways. If you follow those controls, the workplace becomes one of the safest places that you can actually be certainly safer than a supermarket, certainly safer than a, a public space. So I think the that's a very quick cooks tour of you know our approach to testing. There's some really interesting stuff going. Um, you uh, that are being developed. The one we're very excited about, which is a test which you uh, don't use a swab at all. You actually just uh, spit into a little tube, and that will give a result. That's got to be tested properly. We do the testing at Teesside Airport for uh, in combination with the. Uh, the mayor's office and the combined authority down in Teesside. And one of the things we're looking at is a rapid PCR test on site that will give the results within about 30, 40 minutes. So the idea being that if you're traveling, you can sort of go do your test, go and have a coffee, a cup of, uh, and a drink, and you get your certificate to fly. So there's lots of exciting stuff coming through. There's some very interesting uh, tests in particular that we're uh, waiting to have delivered because we test a lot of these things, which is a test to, to highlight whether a vaccine has given and basically created the right uh, immunity and is something that can be used again to identify people who are specifically safe um, within the workplace around which you can build other bubbles. The vaccine, I would say straight away, we've got to be very careful about it. It's great news, but it will not reduce transmission. And it certainly won't impact on the, on transmission in the workplace. So you can probably tell this is a massive subject. I'm very happy to engage with people afterwards, but it'd be good maybe if, um, if we opened it up to some of the questions that are coming out. But a personal view for us, I'm a great believer in the lateral flow, both the antigen and antibody tests. And I think they are probably the, our experiences, they are the most effective way of identifying and managing transmission out of the workplace. Brilliant, thank you, John. And as you say, there's a, there's a huge topic there. Um, and I'm sure we'll have some questions, so please do pop them in the chat um, from, from now. Um, I just want to take sort of chair's prerogative a little bit here. And if I may, and conscious that um, if anyone's gone for a cup of tea, if they haven't got their camera on, I'd just like to invite Ruth Owen from Ben Teller Automotive to come in and share your experience, Ruth. And I know, um, of course, like many on the call, COVID safety is very much on your agenda and also your regime with testing. If you could share your experience with us, please, Ruth. Morning, all. Um, yes, <laughs> sorry. Um, we've been, uh, because of the Corby area being one of the highest uh, um, infectious areas for COVID, we started testing straight after Christmas because we had a lot of people who didn't return back after catching it and then we had one two cases in the workplace on the Monday on return from the force. We've engaged um, a clinician to an occupational health to actually do 
And what we did in the first week, we had all the flow testing and we had found one asymptomatic person on site. So they were sent home to self-isolate. We informed our workforce, so we'd had one positive. And we took the decision to then um, split the business into two bubbles because we were working two shifts at the moment. We split the management team onto the two shifts as well so that we can actually minimise the risk to the business. We've been testing every, every week since then. The following week, we had two management team members test positive. And the difference that they had done was instead of holding our management daily meeting in our operational control center, they'd held it in a smaller meeting room with five of them in there with the window open. And that is the only place where we could actually establish that they'd been in co close contact with them. So we had nearly half the management team actually self-isolating and just two weeks ago, and they're returning to work today. Nobody else in the workforce was affected. We tested again last Thursday. We ended up with one person asymptomatic who was a home worker because we offered our home workers the opportunity to come and get tested. We had nobody actually on site. Whilst we were carrying out the testing, we also had the police turn up because they had received a phone call from a relative of an employee claiming that we were not acting safely when somebody tested positive. They came on site. We took them through everything that we were doing. They could see that we were doing the testing and they went away and commented that we were one of the best in the area that they'd been on. The majority of our workforce are all actually um, very positive about everything that we've put in place with our one-way systems. Everybody wears a mask from the moment they um, arrive on site after being temperature tested. What is interesting is that we've had, ha we haven't stopped anybody due to temperature. So at the moment, we're questioning, should we still carry on with the temperature testing? Because that has not been um, a symptom. Can I, can I skip in on this one, Ruth? Because I think this is a really interesting one. If you look at the breakdown of people who may have the virus, about depending on which study you look at and which country you look at, you're looking around probably up to anywhere between 50 and 86% of people will be asymptomatic. They will not show us a temperature at all. Of the remaining maybe 20%, we reckon it's about 80%, about 20% of the people who actually are symptomatic will only around 12% of that group will show a temperature. So actually, the, the, the problem, would it's not that sh people shouldn't do it. It's just an additional layer of um, to make a judgment on. This is why I think different points are so important to take. It's, it's not a one hit wonder to be able to sort this stuff out. But actually, with temperatures, what we found is there's other factors. If you've got arthritis, if you're on the menopause, for example, it's up, you're going to have raised temperatures. And we've had cases where people are being sent away um, and repeatedly refused because people understand that other health conditions will naturally raise the temperature. Um, we've had one thing where one guy got sent away, um, even though he just cycled 20 miles to get to work. So his temperature was uh, up there too. I had COVID back in May last year. And we, in a weird way, it was quite helpful because we were able to test out all these things and our processes on our, ourselves because we're weird like that, yeah. But what was interesting was uh, we didn't have any of the four main symptoms that are highlighted by uh, government guidance. Um, so the passport to work thing, for example, 
Um, uh, we've highlighted the top 14 that can be part of that. And temperature is actually a very low indicator of, of the virus going forward. There's about 46, 47 main symptoms for COVID um, which pop up. This may change, of course, as well with the variants. The good news on testing for the variants, I'll just say this, I forgot to say, is that actually the indicators are both for uh, South Africa and the UK uh, variants that the tests, current testing will pick them up. So that's a really, that's a real positive. It's, we're waiting to hear about the Brazilian ones now. Yeah, it, it, it'd be interesting. There's a question that's come through to do with masks. Um, it's our actual group policy and we're part of, it's strange, we're part of Southern Europe um, and our Spanish um, health and safety um, director is also an occupational health doctor. And in other parts of the group, they can wear material masks and that, as has asked us to continue wearing the blue masks. The feedback from our staff is that they actually, although they don't like it, a lot of them feel a lot better by having the masks. If they have to work um, very closely because we of the weight of some of our product, they also have to wear a visor for that actual time as well. It's only very short. I, I think what we take away is that I have some vulnerable people, including myself, and I will go to work, but I won't go to the supermarket. And with that sort of like temperature check within the workplace and that we're getting such a positive basis is that we'll continue with what we've got. We keep asking if there's any improvements that we can make and everybody keeps going, no, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, we're actually trying to decide if this week we do the testing because of, in effect, we haven't had a case on site for two weeks or whether we delay it till next week. So, but we're going to get a, because they're now doing lateral flow in the Corby area, we're now sort of like thinking this week, we'll leave it and we'll do it the following week. We're not going to be right whatever we do. It's, it's a bit like anybody who makes any decisions on whatever they implement at the moment. We can only do what we think is right for the company and our so, workforce. Um, so say, um, just to reiterate what we saw in the poll there, I mean, most members of the call and what we see from members is they are confident more often than not in their measures but it's as you say how can we continue to improve that and make staff feel as comfortable on, on site as possible as Ruth says there that's a, a feedback we hear from members a lot uh, that staff feel much safer on site than they would do uh, in their local Tesco or, or Costa Coffee or wherever you, uh, you may frequent. Um, just two things we've not touched on I was hoping to come to you Tim just on your perspective or experience Tim Kibble that is on um, the use of face masks in sight, on site and the track and trace app, which we, we do have a lot of, um, sort of debate around the track and trace app and how it's used and, and some of the issues with it, of course. But just to, just to, I know you sort of spoke on your environment, Tim, I was wondering if you could get a bit of, from, from your perspective on those two issues in particular. You may not be using masks, I mean, I must add. On, on the mask front, we, we require people to wear a mask um, as soon as I leave the car or whatever mode of transport they use to get to work. And they wear that till they get to the point of where they're working. And if where they're working, it's from the risk assessment, it's, they're not in contact with anyone else. I can remove the mask. So if I want to go and walk around the plant, I, I wear a mask um, until I get back to my desk. But also the, the, we've been um, coaching people on how you wear your mask. We get the odd person who wants to slip it down off the nose um, and some don't want to wear them. That's where we got consequential last week. Um, there are a, a small percentage of the population uh, uh, sort of still in denial, I think, about the, the virus. Um, they want to almost protest, but it's a requirement and you've got to wear it. So, so that's where we are. Um, and the other topic you mentioned, 
and the track and trace app itself yeah the track and trace app we, we, we had a plant where someone left it in the locker and that caused um a lot of employees to have time off uh, well first of all you shouldn't be using lockers from my my point of view we stopped using lockers but they did use lockers still and the phone was left in the locker and most everyone in that shift walked past that locker so you ended up with a shift's worth of people that were pinged and on monday morning you got a you got a major problem so we've we've encouraged people to turn the app off we've still had a case uh, recently where three people um left the app on at work and got pinged with each other um so we're trying to reinforce that one turn the app off when you're at work and you can't just, always 100 percent no absolutely thank you thank you tim and i will come to you in just a second barry and just to say it's of course really sensitive around how you communicate that message around the app and its uses and i think the locker example is is the best one we've used when speaking to government around the app and how it's how it's implemented in, in our sites but barry you just wanted to come in there yeah, there's one thing I forgot to mention about the the Public Health England representative that we spoke to about our cluster made it absolutely clear to us that PHE were not concerned about the passing of the virus in the workplace because they considered that workplaces should be COVID safe places. And primarily they were concerned with the, uh, the spread of the virus in the community, not the workplace. Absolutely. And um, conscious of the time, I just wanted to kind of almost give a, a final word, word before we come to half past the hour to Ian, um, just on the perspective that you've heard today from members and a bit of a reflection of, the, of your work again for the last nine months and, um, and, and how Make UK can help as well. Yeah, well, I think um, one of the things we can take away from today is the future of testing. And I, and I think that um, testing has, has a great future here. And it was really good to hear uh, John's perspective on, on testing. I think we've all got a lot to learn from that and how we deploy testing and, and, and make the most of it. Um, I think the other uh, question I'd probably just like to touch on before I come back to the audit is, is this question that I can see in the chat is cropping up all the time, is, is, is the word mandatory. And um, we just have to be careful with the use of mandatory. Uh, you can set all the rules that you want in your workplace and make them mandatory, that's fine. But actually, if you're setting a rule that can't be substantiated in law, you're probably um, going to end up in a sticky place if someone challenges your mandatory requirement. And I think it's a much better approach to actually defer to the moral duty we all have to comply with rules here and um, keep our colleagues and, and neighbours safe by wearing masks or complying with rules voluntarily rather than the employer aiming to enforce a rule that actually in the end game may not be entirely enforceable and uh, will, will create problems. So it's just a point to think about there. And I think, again, this is where consultation and communication really come to the fore. And uh, this is the kind of thing that we would look for in our, in our COVID compliance audit, where, where these aspects are and perhaps not working as well as they might do for, for you as an employer. And indeed, the whole thrust of that audit is not to kind of catch you out or find fault or pick holes in what you're doing. It is to help you improve what you're doing and, and have a, a stronger, secure secure workplace as, as a result of that. So um, I think those, those, are the, those are the main things. Uh, it's good to hear everybody's um, detailed examples of things that they're doing in their workplace. And this is typical across industry, I think. There's lots and lots of tremendous work going on uh, to keep the workplace safe. And I, and I fully concur with the, the, the view that was made uh, towards the end there that, that actually work is a safe place to be. Uh, transmission, I think, by and large, isn't happening at work. It's happening outside of work. and indeed that raises a further point about communication with your people what you do out of work is just as important as what you do in work absolutely thank you Ian. and yeah just to say of course we've, we've tried to focus here on the, in, the environments here of our sites and also also the operational controls but of course if you're looking at how to manage staff with specific cases around masks and and the vaccine and that kind of thing moving forward please do check out the make uk website for our faqs around those issues or, or those of you that have HR and legal advice from us in, within your membership, make sure you're reaching out to your advisor and our advice line to take you through some of those uh, more individual problems and, and provide the guidance there. Um, as Ian's referred to, of course, we'll share the information for our COVID audit and show how we can come round for a day and try and shore up any practices and, 
and also we do offer training for individuals so looking at staff on, on how to remain safe from from their perspective not just from the employer's perspective um, and we'll also share the contact details um, with, with John's organization as a, as a, a kind of consultancy and advisor and provider uh, of testing solutions as well but um, just want to say to reiterate earlier apologies if you had any technical problems joining us this morning um, we will share a full recording of this session with, with, with all, all of you in the audience as I say we'll share some more information from, from how we can help but also a big big thank you to John, Tim, Barry and Ian for speaking from their sort of perspective and their experiences and for you guys joining us this morning as well so thank you very much and I'll, I'll close the meeting there.